Hello, I'm Victor Jernigan, and this is Serious Information About Real Estate. Today, I'm having a continuation of the conversation on homelessness that started with the research that I had done for the Project Room Key video. That's the video that I posted about homeless in California, how to lose $100 million. A very well-intentioned but badly executed use of federal government money. During the research on that video, I came across the name Bob Erlenbush. Uh, he was interviewed on a local TV station. So it was interesting to me why this person was picked to be interviewed. And when I did the research, it turns out that this is a 40 year advocate for the homeless across the United States, but primarily in California. He previously had been the executive director of the Los Angeles Coalition to End Hunger and Homelessness. He's on the he's a board member of the National Coalition for the for the homeless. He is now the executive director of the Sacramento Regional Coalition to end homelessness. This is someone who really has strong beliefs and opinions and would have served the state of California well if they had asked him before they began spending money on their homeless program. Bob did not know me from the man in the moon. I sent him an email saying that I'd seen the interview and I would like to have a Zoom call with him to discuss issues of homelessness, Project Room Key in California and other issues around the United States. Ideas which he has seen work to help the homeless that could be implemented in every community. I really do hope you take a few minutes to listen to this video. Um, it's, uh, it is really worth your time if you have interest in any topic that involves uh, or, or ways to help the homeless population in your community. And then separately, if you like the video, it helps me understand that I'm posting good information. If you subscribe to the channel, I appreciate it for sure. And certainly leave comments about things that you th on this video or other issues that you want me to begin to cast an opinion on. So I do appreciate your time and I am certain you will find this very interesting. Now, the, inv the conversation with Bob Erlenbush. Bob, um, it's very nice of you to uh, take a completely random email invitation to do a Zoom meeting. Sure, so I really do appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you reaching out to me, so there you go. Uh, so I guess the issue that I'm inquiring from you is what do you see to be the biggest stumbling block that you've run into over the 40 years that you've been involved? <laughs> well, one is lack of political will, quite frankly, to really address the homeless crisis uh, to scale. Um, I mean, we're starting to get there, but that but it's been a heavy lift from the feds, the city, and the county. I mean, if you look at HUD funding since basically 1978, it went. Um, it was cut by Ronald Reagan. The affordable housing budget was cut by Ronald Reagan. Um, by 75% and it's never been replaced by by any president. So, you know, and there's been a lack of political will to to put money into housing to the scale that's needed. So how would you, so let's go back to the fact that Project Room Key has rented 10,000, I think they've got 10,000 rooms rented. Well, it's, really, it's really undersubscribed, I mean, in Sac and it depends on what city you're talking about. In Sacramento, we were supposed to have, you know, the mayor promised 800 rooms and only half of that has been filled since late March. We've got 59 FEMA trailers and only nine people have been placed. So it's been a mess. And you so, know? I mean, it's, it's, this is the point that I'm getting to. Sorry. Okay. That's right. Uh, doing it to mass and getting the people to move in. This is where I see the real uh, dichotomy of the problem. You've, I, looked, I looked at the 35 page document that uh, is Project Room Keys regulations and what they've got to do and how they've got to manage right. it. Right. And, 
and you have to have, if you have one person in the motel, you've got to have 24 hour a day security and they right. just don't have the people. I mean, I don't know where the idea came from. They were going to find all these people to man the hotels. That, that, getting the homeless to move in, that, as you were saying, undersubscribed, they don't want to leave their, I mean, my experience has been, the, I've known lots of homeless people in my life. Um, just for one reason or another. They don't necessarily choose to be homeless or shelterless. Right. But they don't mind living in a tent in a park, right? They don't mind. They would rather be unrestricted and able to move around the way they want to than to be confined with rules and regulations they don't want to put up with. And I'm not saying that people choose to be shelterless, but in a lot of situations, people do. I mean, it's just that it's just clear that they do. And yes, some of that's mental health issues. Some of it's drugs. So I how, know. Do, how, how does how does a housing program solve that? That's the question. I mean, that it clearly isn't solving it right now. So how do you get them the mental help, or how do we? I mean, because when you look well, at that the, camps, the whole like, idea of Project Room Key was to have uh, the direct services to go with it, but it's not been terribly successful, at least in our community. So and now it turns out now it turns out that they didn't that some of the insurers are saying that the hotels cannot be used for for that purpose to house um, people experiencing homelessness. So it wasn't very well researched. <laughs> no, it was, it, uh, it was, I mean, you know, realistically, you're gonna take 15,000 hotel rooms. I mean, they were trying to use the Ritz-Carlton in downtown LA. That by itself is, I think, foolish. Yeah, but, the, uh, but in general, if you take 15,000 hotel rooms, there is the one side that the hotel rooms have been empty because of uh, COVID-19. Oh, it's, yeah. And it, yeah. It, 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 I, I can see where it was a good idea. I mean, I can see the thought process. We're going to take these hotel rooms that are vacant. We're going to pay the hotel operators the money for the rent. And we're going to put the homeless in there that need shelter. I mean, I, I get the idea. They need, be, they need to be quarantined. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I, I get the idea. But the problem has been I, that I see is that when you look at what is required, there's no way to implement it. There's just, uh, first off. To me, to me, there's a bigger problem. Okay. If it had been, if it was in the least bit successful placing 15,000 people, uh, homeless people into hotel and motel rooms, what happens on the back end? <laughs> there's not 15,000, there's nowhere for them to go. Right. Then you may get a, you know, 10% into housing, but I mean, we've got a 1%, 2% vacancy rate in Sacramento. There is nowhere to send people once they've been, you know, once they've gotten better or recovered or whatever. So, so we're I mean, not a is, larger issue. So Knoxville uh, is a microcosm of the situation. We're, uh, an 800,000 person metro area where okay. um, about the city of Knoxville is 180,000. There's about 500,000 people in the county total, including so, the city. Yeah. So you probably have you, how many people in your community? There's um, in the, in, in Knoxville and Knox County combined, there's about 500,000 people. 500,000. So 1%. Yeah. So you probably have about 5,000 homeless people at least. Oh, I'm, it's some, I'm sure it's in that kind of number. Uh, nobody has an accurate count on it. Well, yeah, no community. There, and so- the, But the, ballpark, most communities, it runs 1% of the house population. So we've got the same situation. There's um, not enough housing. We have uh, sure. uh, you know, days on market for houses before, before COVID-19. Days on market for a house, we're generally running you know, 28 to 35 days for uh, a listings. And so it's a very fast selling, not as fast as San Francisco or Sacramento, maybe, but very fast comparatively. We have a. Just out of curiosity, what's the average home price? Uh, uh, Two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> don't laugh. Don't laugh too hard. Come on. When do I move? When, do, when can I move? <laughs> hey, so that you know that gets to be the issue, right? There's all the in, in Knoxville. There's a big thing about, and Tennessee in general. Um, but also what's your wages, what's your salary level. So it's all relative, right? Exactly. So we've got in the East Tennessee market, we've got um, effectively a 1% or 2 in, in the Knox County, it's probably a 2% unemployment rate. Uh, there's lots of jobs that tens of thousands of jobs are coming to East Tennessee in the manufacturing industry. We don't get the corporate 
relocations. We don't get the, okay. uh, like Nashville does. Nashville gets all the big corporate headquarters. Right, right, but, right. But we've got all the manufacturing. So there's um, all kinds of auto manufacturing and related products, electronic right. manufacturing. Right. Okay. So it's, it's, you know, really solid jobs in that um, 16 to $30 an hour with benefits oh, kind of bad. pay range. Yeah, that's not bad. So it, it makes Knoxville in the, in the area generally affordable, but the issue gets to be zoning in the, in the sense that the, um, probably good if I'm having a meeting that I turn my own phone off, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, but the, the situation here is that um, getting zoning done uh, where you can have more cheaper housing is almost impossible. Right. Uh, and it's the same uh, in Sacramento, I'm sure. Oh, it, it's the same, unfortunately. So, so when you go to city council tonight, what are you going to be asking them for? Oh, this specifically is on uh, the CARE stimulus money. The, we, the city got $89 million in federal funding. Whoa. So they, yeah, for the CARES Act, right. Our county got $183 million. How many people are in Sacramento? Oh, city proper, about 500,000. And you got $89 million from the CARES Act. The stimulus money, right. I'm gonna, I don't think Knoxville got anything close to that. Wow, I, wanna, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't um, either, but I'm gonna, I, but I'm gonna find out because I don't think we got anything good. like that. That's interesting. <laughs> Um, so the mayor put out a week ago a framework on how to spend the money. Twenty million for economic development, twenty million for homelessness, twenty million for this, that, and the other thing, right? So we put together a coalition. Um, we had fourteen organizations, homeless service providers, sign on to to a letter to city council um, saying these are our recommendations. So that's what tonight, but, but there is no city council meeting because they don't meet because of the COVID. So Does the best we can meeting? do, no, we don't, they don't meet in person. So we either do a Zoom meeting with the city council or we phone in or we submit electronic comments or whatever. Oh, we're so doing that, the same here, exactly the same yeah, here. Yeah, I think, I think most communities are, right? Bob, um, are you going to ask them to reallocate more money to the homeless or? Well, the mayor's already provided a framework, 20 million for economic development, 20 million for youth, 20 million for the arts, and 20 million for homelessness. So we are focused on 20 million for homelessness. And so our big recommendation is not to dismantle the COVID in infrastructure that they've already put together. You know, there's outreach. We have about 80 to 100 encampments in Sacramento County. So they're providing um, not as many as we need, but they're providing meals and, and um, medical teams, outreach. And we finally got them to place about 60 porta potties out in encampments. So, so we don't want them to dismantle the infrastructure that they've set up. I mean, who knows what's going to happen um, as communities reopen, COVID may come back even worse. I hope not, but it could. But, and and um, to create that infrastructure all over again would be a nightmare. Anyway, so that's, that's what tonight is for us. So, for example, like this issue of the porta potties. Uh, there's a lot of resistance uh, in a, a lot of places that I've looked at across the country to providing too much social services for the homeless. I mean, I think I, I, I watched a video that you were in. Quite frankly, I'm sorry. I don't understand. It's a public health nightmare. I mean, businesses cannot have it both ways. From my perspective, you can't complain about having to pick up human waste on your doorstep if there aren't any bathrooms that are open for people to go. So, so I, it's a public, I mean, we are lucky in this community 
was because we had a huge hepatitis A outbreak a year ago that started in San Diego. Right. And hepatitis A, as you probably know, is caused by not having the ability to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. Um, so we had about 50 homeless people die up and down the state from hep A. Um, so I'm a really strong proponent of providing dignity to people. So, so let's say let we agree on that point that that's, that's essential. So that brings me to the question of, uh, I think I saw a previous video. Uh, you were on the video a lot about three years ago, by the way, on YouTube. I was easy, <laughs> it was easy to find lots of video of you. Yeah, and, that's pretty uh, easy, yeah. And there was a, uh, a statistic that I think you used that 75% of all the homeless in any community is from that community. And that Actually, is really higher. It's a, um, yeah, when you look at the homeless count for Knoxville, yes. every every two years, communities that receive federal funds have to do a count. So it should be in your homeless count how many people. But in Los Angeles, it's run, it runs almost 90% are from LA. In Sacramento, it runs about 82 to 85%. Uh, born and raised here. So very few people um, come from other places. So, I mean, that's the first myth that we run into, uh, that the homeless are being oh, yeah, shipped in from somewhere else. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that you, yeah, you've, I've heard it all <laughs> in 40, in 35 years. So the issue, but, but the issue gets to be that homeless camps, um, the home, and I, and again, I, I hate the word homeless because nobody says that they're condoless or farmless or yeah, apartmentless. I, I used unhoused neighbors. Unhoused neighbors, that's good. I use shelterless. So Yeah, I, I noticed. Uh, so the, the issue there gets to be the recent decision, and uh, I think you're on the National Coalition, uh, one of the board of directors. Board, I've been on the board for the National Coalition for the Homeless in D.C. for 20 years. So you all came in late, but you came in, I think, on the Martin versus Boise uh, case. And yes. I, I think that reshapes all of uh, the homeless conversations in every city in America sometime this year. Am I well, crazy about that or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we, we were happy with the Martin decision. Um, all well, the cities weren't, I can tell you LA wasn't. <laughs> Sacramento wasn't either. There are about 35 uh, jurisdictions up and down California who wrote amicus, amicus briefs to yes. the court, friends of the court um, to try to get them to um, to uh, rule overrule the Ninth Circuit Court. But as you know, the Supreme Court didn't even hear it. So technically, I mean, it only applies to the nine states that are in the Ninth Circuit Court. But obviously, as you said, it, you know, other, many other communities that, that are not in the Ninth Circuit also paid attention to the decision because they don't want to be sued, um, either by homeless people or local advocates or the ACLU or whatever. Bob, um, would you take, um, so I'm, I'm going to use this on my, fledged, on my fledgling YouTube channel, but would you take a moment to share what the Martin versus Boise decision was about? Sure. What happened about five years ago um, or so, there were about seven homeless people in Boise, Idaho, that sued the city of Boise, um, basically arguing that if there was not enough shelter, in their case in Boise, um, that um, laws that criminalized people experiencing homelessness, uh, specifically um, anti-camping ordinances, right. was essentially cruel and unusual punishment. It violated the Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Um, right before the uh, Obama administration was done, the department, the Civil Rights Division of the Civil, of the uh, Department of Justice uh, weighed in um, on that case, and they they agreed with the homeless people in Boise. Um, they called it cruel and unusual punishment. What happened was that um, the 
it went to the Ninth Circuit Court. The, the Ninth Circuit Court ruled in homeless people's favor. They agreed that if you do not have enough housing in your community and you enforce anti-camping uh, legislation in particular, that it violates the Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution. The city um, of Boise uh, appealed the decision to the United States Supreme Court. Many jurisdictions, including, like I said, about 35 uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Sacramento, many other communities, uh, <laughs> sent letters to the uh, Friends of the Court uh, uh, briefs, called amicus briefs, to the um, United States Supreme Court um, basically arguing that the Boise decision was too general and they didn't know how to implement it. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the, uh, the United States Supreme Court um, did not take the case. So the Boise decision of the Ninth Circuit Court stands. And the way, the reason that I had pointed this out uh, to people previously is that this particular decision requires the cities to provide shelter uh, or specific camping areas, or people can, I think the decision that was made was that the um, a local community cannot stop people from doing what comes naturally to the human being, which includes uh, sleep. And so sleeping in public and public areas and on public spaces is legal, but also all other functions that become, that are common to the human being um, are able to be done in public places. Well, in and, theory, that's the logic of Boise, but I mean, most communities, are, well, I'll just speak for Sacramento. Our park rangers, um, basically, in, as soon as the Boise decision happened, even before it went to the Supreme Court, I started, I was um, fearful because of the what happened at the Board of Supervisors when they announced the Boise, Boise decision. What happened? So, well, essentially what happened is the uh, county council instructed our county park rangers not to enforce the anti-camping ordinance. And so what happened, the Board of Supervisors got pissed off and said, well, then when you go out to encampments, enforce everything else that you can think of, which they have. We, we hardly had any citations uh, for a couple of things. And the big three right now are, it went from just a handful of citations a month to hundreds a month for three violations. Having a shopping cart in the park, littering, of course, there's no choice because there's no trash cans in the up and down the American River Parkway. Right. And attaching a structure to a tree. In other words, tying a rope to a tree to keep your tent up. Um, so that went just from a handful. And you know what I'll do is I'll put you on our uh, email list. So you, I do a monthly newsletter. I'd so, appreciate that. And we'll keep, and w I keep stats uh, on a monthly basis. Primarily because it's easy to do. Um, the park rangers post their um, activity reports every month. So, so what I did was went and back to uh, this is a year ago. So I went back a couple years and tried to create a baseline of what were the tickets being handed out other than um, uh, camping citations because on average they were close. They were handing out about three to 400 anti-camping uh, uh, cit citations a month. Now they're closing, up until COVID, they were closing about 400 encampments a month and handing out hundreds of tickets for those three things I just mentioned. Um, because of the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, right. uh, they, uh, yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with it, because of the guidelines, that the feds told communities don't move homeless encampments because it's a health hazard. It makes it hard to, for health workers to find work, the people. To find people, right, exactly. Well, we still are fighting that battle, as many communities are. 
the city police, the, the sheriffs, the park rangers, now um, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and uh, Caltrans, which is a state agency that right. deals, with, um, deals with the freeways. Um, they, all, they all are continuing to, to close down homeless encampments and move people around. So our county health director issued a directive, a very sternly worded health order on last Friday to stop it. So we'll see if it works. So what, what do you think of, of ways to allow the homeless camps, the, the places of non-permanent residents to continue, but become cleaner places to live? I mean. I go back to uh, cleaning up the jungle in San Jose and the, all the video that was, and all the follow-up video that was created, both pro and con, for the the, 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 the the trash piles and the needles and everything else that were removed after the 200 people were evicted from the jungle. Right. I mean, that's one of the most yeah. documented homeless camps, I think, that I know of well, in the they, last 15 years. They actually, ironically, they had a, a terrible, really violent, homeless encampment in Seattle for for years and years and years. It was also called the jungle. Ah. It was out of downtown Seattle. Um, well, to me, there's some good model programs around the country. Um, Oakland, in, in particular, they have, they pass out trash bags to the encampments. They have regular trash pickup once a week. They drive around and pick up the trash so the camps are really neat. Um, you who know, owns the land? Who owns the land where the where these I camps think are? It, um, mostly, it's city property. So they're very well maintained. They've got porta potties that are maintained. They've got, um, and the whole goal is to move people out of the encampments into housing. So right. they've created a tiny homes program. I don't really care for it because um, because they're tough sheds, and it's like really. We can't provide any more dignity to people than than a tough shed uh, and a porta potty, um, but at least you know at least it brings people um, out of encampments for the most part. So it's been pretty successful. So it's really um, it's really important. That's why city council tonight is important um, to not um, have the city. Um, dismantle the COVID infrastructure that they've created because we've been calling for porta potties and sanit and trash pickup um, and food and water. I mean, it's 106 degrees today, so you know, luckily we haven't had any homeless people die of dehydration. But wouldn't surprise me that the people are are you know desperate for for some you know water to drink. I mean, it was so bad. It was in the 90s a week ago, and they put out, the city put out about 50 hand washing stations, and right. we'd go by hand washing stations, and we would go by um, the, the encampments, and people were so thirsty, they were drinking the water out of the hand washing stations. So it's really sad. Yeah. So the, um, that I guess brings us full circle to Project Room Key. Uh, <laughs> the, right. How's the, I mean, I, I just see nothing but flaws with that problem, with that whole process. Forget the, forget it's losing a million dollars a month, but we could fast, a million dollars a day, but we could fast track to the point that you brought up is what happens at the end of uh, July when the program expires. Yeah. They're not thinking long run. They're not thinking, you know, what, what happens to this? I mean, those people will be discharged back to the streets. I mean, the really sad, the real, the real crisis. If this isn't bad enough, um, there was a um, report done about two weeks ago by an economist at Columbia University. Um, basically, over the last forty to fifty years, homelessness and unemployment track along each other. Right? Unemployment goes down, homelessness goes down. Right. Unemployment goes up, homelessness goes up. Given the high rate of unemployment that has been, 
you know, reported around the country. Right. Um, this economist sadly predicted that homelessness in the United States could increase by 45% by the end of the year. Could almost double. So I think in this particular situation, I think that's probably an exaggeration of the number just simply because they've got programs in place to help a number of people, but there's no question that homelessness is going to increase. I, I don't, I don't see it increasing by those kind of numbers, but I do see it increase. There's no way that it doesn't increase. I mean, it has to it just, it just, it, uh, no. it's a reality. I, I hope it does. I hope that those numbers are off. Um, but, but, um, you know, right now the cares act or, or the heroes act in Congress, doesn't have any support from the current administration or the Senate, and that would extend homeless, uh, I mean, unemployment benefits, you know, through early uh, next year. So people's unemployment insurance is gonna run out, seniors, you know, veterans on fixed income, when the rent protections, I don't know if Knoxville has implemented uh, rent protections. Um, you can't be evicted because if you lost money, you know, if you lost income due to COVID, uh, we have in California and many other places around the country, but those are set to expire in July. And you just know that landlords are gonna start evicting people. Um, and those people will become, many will become homeless. Well, so I, I agree with you. The, 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 the follow-up- Homelessness is gonna go up. Yeah, there's no question that it will. The issue for, uh, t so Tennessee, is the state with the um, lowest number of unemployment compared to the national average. But the, there's a lot of great right now. Yeah, we're doing really well compared. I mean, we're, we're the number one state for people not going on unemployment. The, oh, good for you. Well, but the, but the other side of it is in, in Tennessee, the unemployment's like $275 a week. So it, um, it, it, people are encouraged to go back to work. The, there's a lot of lots of discussion, uh, Bob, about this extra six hundred dollars a week that's being paid, and it's a discouragement. Uh, yeah, that's for, supposed to end um, at, in July. Right, and so the issue is, I, I think, for a lot of play, people, it's not the that there shouldn't be unemployment that would continue to be able to be received. It's the amount of the extra, and if that the amount of the extra is reduced, I think you'd find much more support for it. Uh, because it gets to be tricky because a lot of these businesses took that PPP money and if you don't use it for payroll, it becomes a loan. If you do use it for payroll, well, it, it's really, yeah. And then if you call people back to work and they don't show, they don't want to come back because they're making more on unemployment than they were making employed. And they're but, scared because, you know, God knows if this, if we've really flattened the curve on this thing, but we'll find out. Hey, it won't take long, will it? I get, I make it three. You and I, you got, you've got 14 days. I got 21. So we're, we're going to be in that. One of us is going to be right. Now our, our unemployment rate in Sacramento right now is right around 15%. That's, uh, which is pretty significant. It's really significant compared to what it was. So Bob, when, um, yeah, I've we, got a, we jumped, we jumped in a, in two months from 4% to 15% unemployment. Yeah, I think I, I think Knoxville's at 10 or 12. And as I said, we were at two, 3% previously. Sure, 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 sure. The, the, the question, did, but following back around to the Martin versus Boise and camping uh -huh. in public parks. So um, I saw that San Francisco <laughs> opened up some kind of pu public park to uh, distant spacing where you've got, where people can pitch a tent and or have yeah, a space. CDC is saying that for encampments um, should have about 12 square feet, you know, 144 square feet, 12 by 12. Right. Space. So hopefully that works. Could, could something like that be implemented? At, you, you said there were 80 to 100 homeless encampments in Sacramento County. Well, that's, you, been, that's already been implemented, you know, there have been outreach workers go to as many of the encampments as possible uh, to get people to social distance. What do you? Oh, we, do you, we it's been successful. We haven't had it. We've only had a handful of of homeless people um, get COVID, and so far, thank God, knock on wood, no one's died. Uh, I've got a really good 
a really good, one of my best friends um, is a big time hiker. And I, uh, I mean, he's a, he's hiked all over the Smoky Mountains and all over America. And uh, he's right now, he's on a, uh, an eight week hike out in Utah, uh, covering every how many hundreds of miles. And I've I thought many times that I ought to shoot a video. Uh, he's got his own YouTube channel. He posts videos and he's got a video on um, how to hang a bear bag, which, which has got like 90,000 views. You know, first off, that means to me, you get 90,000 people who want to hike where there are bears. But the reason that I'm saying that is that his videos, he's camping in a tent. He, uh, when he's going hiking, he's leaving his tent and he'll go on a hike and he refers to his tent as home base, right? Nice. So uh, yeah. he takes, he takes he, when he hikes in, he takes everything he owns on his back and uh, he's completely self-supporting. He mm -hmm. ties things off to a tree so other people or animals won't steal them. I mean, you, and yet he is um, among a group of hikers who are, uh, hiking all over America, thousands, tens of thousands of people hiking every right. day, right? Right, right. Effectively doing exactly what the shelterless are doing. Yeah, it's sort of the point. <laughs> I mean, it really is, isn't it? Well, it's a double standard, right? It's a, I, I think it's a complete double standard. The difference is that the shelterless are doing it in closed-in environments, effectively public parks, public lands, uh, condemned well, I mean, lots, city-owned lots. In, they have to. In Sacramento, we have about 6,000, and that's a low number, about 6,000 people at any given point um, during the year. 70% are outside through no fault of their own. We don't right. have enough shelter. We don't have enough emergen emergency shelter. So let alone affordable uh, housing. So, so that's what I meant about addressing the crisis to scale. So there's a, a um, I forgot the name of the, uh, I want to say it's in San Antonio. Uh, it's a large warehouse district. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, was taken over uh, by uh, a group and they, uh, in, I they think it was secured, Austin. Austin, okay. And they've, they've secured um, like two big parking lots. And they put up uh, like these uh, shade umbrellas that you would see uh, at picnic areas or something. And anybody can go camp in those areas. They can check themselves. They, they've got to check in, but they're allowed to stay, go and stay. There's shared restrooms, um, and, but it's secure. Um, and they, you stay in the, the open area for, uh, in shade. Uh, they got fans in the summer. But it's got, as I said, public restrooms, water, uh, and yeah. you, you stay there for a few days and uh, you get to qualify for a space indoors. I don't, you know, it's, um, it's, it's always a trade-off between keeping the homeless together. Um, you know, if, well, especially, if I, during, especially during the COVID pandemic, um, you know, people don't want to go inso into congregate living. That's because right. you're at high risk of getting sick and dying. So I was talking to a shelter provider the other day and I said, you know, what with the CDC guidelines, how much bed space do you lose? He said that to implement the social distancing in emergency shelter, they lose 50% of their bed space. So if you've got a 200 bed shelter, now during COVID, you've got a 100 bed shelter. So this goes back to the it means this, that more people are outside. And so that, but that goes is, back to the hotel rooms, right? Right. And and also what what is the obligation of the community if they allow people to to stay in parks and they don't want to build shelters? And this is the point that I was making out cuz you know, if you start having to build shelters for x thousands of people, there's no money in any city. There's no money in the Knoxville budget, I can guarantee it. There's no money in the Knoxville budget to build shelters for a thousand people to stay in. There's just no money. And right. so the the whole and concept is, is the will to do it. 
And you know, uh, that, that's a real trade-off right there. Uh, that will to do it compared to the will to do. Well, it's the not my backyard. The mayor did a challenge. Our mayor did a challenge a year and a half ago to our eight city council people saying, I want to, I want each of you to put a minimum of a hundred bed emergency shelter or tiny homes or God knows what in your, in your district. And the community meetings were so ugly. <laughs> I, I was about before you said that I could have sold tickets to those events. It was uh, I'm sure because in Knoxville it would be unbelievable the people that would turn out. Yeah. So even if even if like even if uh, our elected officials want to do it, you know, there's so much community resistance. I don't even call it not in my backyard anymore, right? I call it banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. <laughs> That's good. Build absolutely nothing. Anywhere near anything. Anywhere near anything. I gotta, yeah. So uh, I'm going to write that down, make my, all my notes here. Uh, what? Uh, so if the, if the cities aren't going to spend more money on shelter and HUD doesn't have, uh, there's no money coming from the federal government. Ben Carson, for sure. Ugh. Uh, is not going to be releasing more money. Um, rent controls. Um, so being in the real on the real estate side of the transaction, I know rent controls only lead to less property. They they force the small investor out and lend only to, and then eventually you only have large providers of house rental housing. So those are negatives to providing product. How, how do you see a situation? What would, if tough houses don't work uh, as a well, solution, uh, what, what, what do you recommend? Well, you know, I'm a supporter of, of tiny homes, but right. not tough sheds. Tough sheds are tough sheds. There's no insulation. They're meant for your, for your lawnmower and gardening equipment and all that stuff. They're not meant to be livable little houses. Um, there's no insulation. There's no power, there's no bathroom, there's no nothing. Right. Um, so I'm a supporter of tiny homes as, as long as that's the person's choice. Right? Right. Um, as opposed to I'm the mayor, it's it's my way or the highway, right? It's like you either go into a tiny home or you go to jail. I mean, obviously that's an extreme situation. Um, but, but because I challenge our elected officials all the time. If you're not willing to put your mom in a 300 square foot little house, then why do you think it's okay for homeless people? Um, I mean, I get it in terms of real estate. It's, it's you know, it's cheaper to, it's cheap. Um, they're, you know, inexpensive in relative terms. Um, so I support tiny homes up until a point. As long as that is a conscious choice by the person. I mean, take a look, just Google it. Um, there are increasingly studies coming out about tiny homes that they, if you have a mental health issue going into living a tiny home, oh. tiny homes make it worse. Make it way worse. Yeah. So... I mean, that's really logical. I mean, quite seriously, that's just logical. I'm sorry? That's just logical. I mean. Yeah. So if you. Do you but I do, think, I do think tiny homes are, are an answer. You know, they're part of the answer. Um, because we've got to do something to, to create affordable housing for people. Was, did, was it Sacramento? that tried to use containers, um, convert containers into housing. Yeah, that was idiotic. How, how did, why didn't that work out? I mean, they're indestructible. They're 320 square feet They're You can put air conditioning and bathrooms in them. Why yeah, didn't that work? Um, yeah. because it was insanely expensive. It was like millions and millions of dollars and they couldn't find a place to site it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway. Uh, 
the, it's, the same, it's the same problems everywhere. I mean, we got the same problems in Knoxville. You can't get containers um, permitted in the state of Tennessee right now. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Uh, you certainly can't do it in Knoxville. You might be able to do it. might be possible in Nashville, I think. But um, right now in Knoxville, there's no permitting of a container community. So uh, tiny homes are, again, they're, it gets back to a density issue. Right. And it's hard to get the density approved because even if the tiny homes are going to be very expensive, the, the neighborhoods don't want them because it's too dense a population. Uh, so we, we run into the same thing. And that, that idea of putting a hundred bed homeless shelter in every city councilman's district. Ah, I, I, I can't even imagine what those neighborhood meetings were like. They were ugly, but we finally, it took a year and a half, but we did a lot of organizing and we were able to do it. Did you get the other thing? The other thing that we were able to want win, um, and there's, if you go to our website, the Sacramento Homeless Coalition's website, right under, under fact sheets and publications or something like that, um, there's a fact sheet on safe parking programs because we have probably five, six, seven hundred homeless people who sleep in their cars. Um, so uh, safe parking programs are really, are really important. Um, That's a good idea right there. Yeah, it's a wonderful idea. Basically, you've got a, you've got a parking lot. Um, actually, Walmart in different parts of California, they were allowing homeless people to pull in and use their parking lot as a safe parking program. So basically, you pull in at five o'clock at night. You know, church groups, community groups bring sure. bring people food. You open up the bathrooms to the build. You know, to the building that the parking lot's on. Um, and then you know, the kids and the mom and dad can get a good night's sleep, and they leave at seven o'clock in the morning, and then they come back the next day. Um, they're really um. An important answer for people who uh, live in their uh, vehicles, RVs, cars, you know, whatever. Um, um, so there's a fact sheet on safe parking programs on, on our website. So um, as you're looking at how this pro how things are going to be handled going forward, um, and you were talking about the. Uh, they're talking about a continuous fund, a source of funding in uh, Knoxville for uh, the homeless trust fund. And some cities have greater trust funds than others to handle yeah, them. But who, how do you, you know, the, the whole situation of allocating the money. So there was a, a company here in Knoxville that built 170 apartments that call tax credit apartments. So, so they're not, they're subsidized on the front end to allow people who do by they're not they certainly have got jobs they all have, need to qualify mm -hmm. but you know a lot of school teachers no school no starting school teacher in the city of knoxville can really qualify to live in brand new gated apartment communities it, it, right right Same. and and so they qualify to live in tax credit housing but the company that got the million dollars is a big company going back to the fact you know that only big companies get to participate Right. So, I mean, this company had millions of dollars on its balance sheet, but it, it couldn't move forward with this apartment complex unless it got a million dollars from the Affordable Trust Fund in Knoxville. And they, I'm not saying it's a wonderful company, great people. They build a fantastic product. I'm not saying anything about what they did, but I don't know that that company needed the million dollars. They, maybe they needed a tax credit instead of the cash, but what, it, what, so the 20 million that Sacramento's got allocated for the homeless, what are they going to do with it? Well, that's the discussion for city council tonight. I mean, what we're saying is, you know, keep the infrastructure, keep the food, keep providing meals to people, to encampments, keep the porta potties out there, keep trash pickup, you know, on and on. Uh, we want to create a homeless employment program. Um, just for starters, um, I'll send you our, um, rec actually, you know what, I'll, I'll probably post our letter uh, as soon as we're done, because I got to go to lunch in a minute. Um, but I'll post it on our website so you can see what our recommendations are. Bob, I really do appreciate it. I, and I was about, to, I was just looking at my watch. I really enjoyed the conversation. I, I, oh, me too. I mean, you're, 
obviously very passionate as I am about the issue and and you certainly um, understand the the ins and outs of the homeless crisis, not only in your community, but around the country. Well, so I appreciate it, how thoughtful you are. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. I, it's, it's something that affects everyone. It affects everyone's property values, for sure, right? And the, the ability to figure out, and I want to follow up in our next, and we'll, let me end on this. I'd like to have a follow-up conversation where we can talk about the, sure. um, how we would put the homeless to work and how do we get the homeless to clean up their own camps? And how do we help them in their own locations? Because right. I've seen, I've seen the, quite seriously the issues where they, they take possession of the spot where they are. They, uh, they absolutely um, own where they are. They live there. You know, they build underground, so they've got cooler places. Uh, you know, they put up plywood siding for yeah, yeah. their spot. So, you know getting the, the, the next step forward, how do you think in terms of policing your own location and as far as cleanliness and safety is uh, issues I'd really like to have a conversation with you about. Oh, me too. So why don't we set a date? What's today? You want to say like a month from now? Like uh, for any, any time that works for your schedule, it's, it's uh, no problem for me. Um, we'll we'll say, you, uh, why don't we say June 23? June 23. I'll get it on the schedule. Bob, I, I will, I will be, I'll be sending you a link to the video. So you've got it and you can use it for sure in your discussions. And I'll be posting it uh, in um, uh, eventually on my stuff here in Knoxville. Okay. So we're going to do a zoom call on the 23rd at 11. 11 your time, three my time. Great. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Bob, thank you so much. Take care now. Bye. You, you too. Take care.